Hi, this is Charlie Montotiello with Blue Bear Flutes. Of course, uh, you know our Facebook page, our Instagram, and our website's all Blue Bear Flutes, either .com or forward slash before, and then Facebook before and Instagram before. But anyway, uh, today we're talking about Native American drone flutes again. Uh, today I'd like to share some techniques with you that'll help you uh, to play yours better, even if you play an A-frame drone like this, or if you're playing a standard straight drone like this one. Uh, whether you have five or six holes or four holes or no holes, however it works out for your fingerings, is completely up to you. Um, but the techniques I'm going to share with you, something that kind of work with just about everything. So when you look at the mouthpiece, one thing you need to think about is how much air you put through both sides of the mouthpiece. Now, any of you who have heard me talk about wetting out, or maybe if you've seen one of my last drone videos where we talked about wetting out, you don't want to shove the mouthpiece in your mouth. That's a bad idea. Anytime you put a mouthpiece of a Native American flute or something made similar, um, basically if you put it in your mouth, it causes a uh, saliva response, I guess a salivary reaction, and then you start you know, producing more of that. Your mouth becomes very vaporous with moisture and so does your flute. So uh, to stop that from happening, you basically don't shove it all the way in your mouth. So just kind of put your lips against it and blow. Uh, so when you're blowing the flute though, like I was saying, especially with one that has a multiple mouthpieces, I have seen a couple of drones that had one mouthpiece where they're all all the time drones. That's not really my style, but the ones that have the dual mouthpieces like this, you want to focus the air as much in the middle as possible. And also you need to use a constant stream of air. So not you hear it starts wobbling a little bit because probably this side needs to twist that way just a little bit or maybe it was just a little out of, out of alignment or maybe there's a piece of dust in one side of the chamber so whatever happens to one side or the other uh, will affect how it plays and for that reason like I say you want to put equal breath through both of these mouthpiece holes at the same time now a good example of what not to do see I was doing it really good right before we started the video That's me focusing more air. I'm playing faster on this side and slower on this side. So faster air causes your flute to go sharp. I had a video that we did about a year or so ago, maybe two years ago, about um, the difference between 440, 432, and 528, playing in harmony with nature, I think is what we call it. Um, and in that video, I show you how I can play one flute in either 432, 440, or 528 based on how I blow through the flute. So, um, with that, if you blow more through one side than the other, it's going to cause that side to go more sharp and the other side to go a little flat. So that's why you need to focus the air stream evenly. And then also, um, after playing this for such a long time, I've played drums for, for years and years now, I've noticed that I can actually change it a little bit uh, with my tongue. So, I, I don't know if I'm maybe pushing my tongue over to one side so much as I'm just I'm simply you know controlling the air that goes through one side and the other independently and it's quite possible to do that as a matter of fact it's so possible you hear me blowing a little faster through the drone chamber causes it to jump octave you can actually do that while you're playing and not jump octave on this side but only jump octave on that side I know we talked about this briefly before, but this is something that, you know, practice, you can get really good at it. So, so you hear, and, so I'm blowing a little faster through that side ever so slightly and granted it's honestly it's very close to blowing extra fast through both sides but not too much on this side because you don't want to cause it to jump octave of course it's less likely that this side if you notice I was playing it's less likely that it'll jump octave on the higher notes so a little trick for you um, you can cause the one side to jump octave and not the other more so on the higher notes of the flute side so if you're playing along uh, for example, so you hear me jump an octave, this is on the flute side. 
you have to bowl a little bit harder to get it to jump octave, and it's not always pretty. So let's not even go there. Uh, it's not made to be played that way anyway. So therefore, just keep in mind, it's easier to control the jumping octave um, whenever you're playing the higher notes. So if you're wanting to play like all the way up to the top of the scale here, you can do that versus playing the low end. You know, you've got one more finger, and if you put that finger down, you might jump octave on this uh, flute over here as well. So keep that in mind. too shabby I guess. Um, anyway, that's one thing that you can do with air control when it comes to playing through one side or the other a little more than the other. Um, so a few other techniques, if you notice I still do the barking sound and then my jumping bird technique I always talk about. It's always best to do some of these techniques with a light breath rather than blowing too hard because if you jump octave on this side while you're doing the jumping bird technique on this side you may actually um, have a conflict of interest with both sides of the flute. It's getting too busy, you know, if you want to call it that. Uh, so you don't want to make the, the sounds going in too many different directions all at the same time because that will distract from what you're trying to accomplish. And once again, as I had mentioned in one of our last drum videos, it's usually best if you play more slowly. And don't forget too, any of you who have been playing maybe to the intermediate level, maybe a couple of years, um, phrasing is really important. It's what keeps your audience from thinking, did he just stop or what, what happened there? Phrasing usually happens when you take a breath. Um, I mean, I personally phrase my tunes that I play um, outside of my breathing time. I, I'll breathe somewhere in between there. You won't hear it most of the time. but. Um, a lot of times, especially when you're about the two, three year marker on flute playing, or any instrument for that matter, your phrasing is determined and defined by when you need to breathe. So I'll be... can phrase it that way or you might decide you want to play in something that's a little more 4-4 instead of no particular. Um, I always strive when I'm playing this particular instrument, I always strive not to, to play in a key or rather in a time signature. I don't want to uh, affect my audience in such a way that they associate this music with standard modern music. So um, I try to play outside of the 4-4 four, four, or 6-8 or 3-4 or any, anything that's common to 4, um, you know, time signature. I, I want to make them feel like they're listening to modern music. So um, I usually breathe at different times. It's kind of like a haiku, you know, it starts off at one level and when you get done down at the bottom, it's only a couple of words, you know, so it's something like that. But, uh, but that can be done with your breath. So you can think about how long am I going to be playing and then, the reason I'm, I brought that up is because when you're playing the drone, you have less air. So it's not only a good idea to know when to breathe and how to breathe and how to blow and how much and you know all that kind of thing, but you can actually phrase things a little differently. So for example, if I'm playing the flute side, and 
that actually doesn't even feel like the ending of a phrase. It feels like um, I just transferred over to the to the drone part of the flute. So I'm actually uh, I took a quick breath there when I started playing the drone chamber of the flute with the flute. So once again, you know, is without taking the breath. But if you take the breath, most people won't hear that because there's a there's a definitive starting point of picking up the drone chamber. Most people won't hear that as a breath and interpret it mentally as a phrase. So once again, you can play um, straight through. Or you can the other way too so you can take that quick little short breath that you need when you go back to just the flute if that's the way you're playing some people play the drum all the time some people play it sometimes and some people do some amazing stylistic things which I guess I should go, go ahead and get into briefly although we have other videos planned for that um, but once again focusing what you've learned so far on the amount of air to make it play and sound properly through both holes at the same time you can actually play some short little um, pops with a drone flute which makes excellent accompaniment with other flutes so and some people only play that way which like I said myself I like to be kind of a roundabout and do some of just about everything if I can um, but uh, with regards to how you play and what you do and, and those short little pop breaths that you can do. It's just a, basically a starting of the note and a stopping of the note like that um, with your air supply. You're just starting and stopping it, starting and stopping it. And uh, this is a, a really good technique, I feel like, although it is, once again, the way that some people will play the whole way through. They'll play an entire song um, popping the notes like that. Uh, let's see, something else really good that I think that you, you might like uh, about playing both the drone and the flute at the same time. side in there at just random intervals. Um, if I don't know how many of you were paying real close attention, you might want to rewind and check this part out, but I actually breathe three times in that. So uh, that shows that you know you can use the breathing technique of taking a breath during the transitions uh, at the same time that you're you know playing a complete harmony with yourself, um, but not all the time. So it, it makes a really good way to break up the monotony of, once again, only playing the drone, or only playing the hop, or only playing this, or only playing that. If you can mix these things up into little, you know, characterizations and, and figure out a way that you can use them, then, hey, you know, uh, you're getting, getting really close there at that point, I guess I should say. Uh, moving on to the next uh, phrase. Something that I did in one of our previous videos, too, with regards to the air supply and how to change the tone of the flute, um, was I had actually covered it partially with my my leg and that technique is really good it's probably better with one just a little bit longer um, because you can actually cause that chamber or the entire flute to go a little flat it's about a half step that you can do comfortably before it starts sounding kind of eh, like what are you doing or before it causes the flute to jump octave So you don't want to cover it up completely, but uh, once again, that's a good technique that you can play with just any flute in general. But with the drone, there because the drone chamber is, um, I guess it's starved for movement. It's not something that you want to make it busy, but you, at the same time, you want some variation in there. 
And I personally, as I had mentioned in my, one of my last drone videos, is that I don't like to have uh, a drone flute that has multiple pegs that I have to pull out and play only that note or play only. I want to be able to play all this stuff on the fly. So for that reason, I have the one hole in the back and you can change this and make it just a little flat if you needed to, if you're playing the appropriate music there, therefore. Um, and then, some of them allow you to jump octave by blowing a little bit faster. The smaller drone flutes typically have that uh, jump octave thing down to a, a T simply because uh, they have smaller amounts of air to play with in the first place, whereas the larger drones take more air and therefore in production of the flute, it has a wider and deeper air channel, uh, which means it will need more air and to cause it to jump octave. Well, let me back, back step. It'll need more air to make it loud and comfortable sounding, um, but it would take more air to cause it to, to jump octave. So FYI, little drones like our backpack drones that we, we offer in high tones, um, those are actually easier to get the higher octave out of the drone chamber uh, than the larger ones, especially than the large, large ones like the low D's and low E's. Uh, but with those, you don't really want to be too busy in the first place. So uh, I think uh, that covers just about everything. We talked about how much air to blow. Uh, it's going to take some practice. You know, you might find that um, yours doesn't really matter too much how much air you blow, or you might find that you kind of do everything right by accident. Some of us do. Um, and then you might find that you need to focus on what it is you're doing with how much air you're putting through here or there. And um, if, once again, I know uh, talking about breath is really important, but if it sounds like your drone is making that wobble sound, there might be something stuck up in here. You know, it's a good possibility. Uh, so check that. Um, if you have to, if you're a beginner and yours has been making that wobble sound since day one, feel free to ask somebody else for help or contact the flute maker who may say, did you try this? Did you try that? A lot of us have different techniques that kind of help you along to, uh, to get to where you need to go. And of course, each of us know how our particular flutes are made. So if it does something, I might have a different solution than someone else. Of course, we've made a lot of flutes. So I've probably seen it before. And like I always tell people, I have a video on that. Um, but anyway, uh, so like I said, the amount of air, how you use that air, that can be a technique all by itself. And then how you typically play the drone is really up to you. You can be one of those people who play really quick bouncy little tunes, ones that play kind of a always play in the drone chamber. You could be just playing backup for someone else playing the flute or even for yourself playing the flute. Or uh, you can kind of mix all that stuff together and make something really incredible. So I think that's probably the direction I would be looking into anyway. Anyway, I hope that uh, you all have enjoyed this video, and if you haven't seen them, we do have quite a few other videos on how to play the Native American flute, as well as the Native American drone flute, and uh, lots of videos on making flutes, and so many more on the way. So keep an eye out for all that. Don't forget to check out our website. You can actually subscribe to our website, too. If you go down to the bottom of the homepage, there's a button that says, Never Miss an Update. You can click on that little button, put your email address in there, and we'll send you news anytime something major happens and sometimes it's not for two months and sometimes it's once a month and if I get really innovative there might be an email in between a month so that can happen too. Uh, like I said I hope you guys have enjoyed this got something beneficial out of it and of course uh, any questions or comments always put them down below we'd love to hear from you. You can email us as well if you have questions about a flute that's playing or not playing properly or if you want to know how to do something else we'll try to get that out as quickly as possible. Once again, Charlie Montatuyella signing out for Blue Bear Flutes and BlueBearFlutes.com. We look forward to seeing you here again very soon. Y'all take care. Mm -hmm.